Hi everyone, in this lecture one, I wanted to review prerequisite courses. If you cannot understand a slide in today's lecture, please have a look at the related course material. First, circuit theory. As the first concept, the circuit element is introduced. In this course, our semiconductor devices are regarded as circuit elements. A circuit element is the elementary unit of the circuit analysis. It has multiple terminals, at least two. For each terminal, we define terminal voltage and a terminal current. You know, for the terminal current, the incoming current has a positive sign. We have five ideal basic circuit elements, a voltage source, a current source, a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor. For each of them, we have a relation between the terminal voltages and the terminal currents. For example, a constant voltage difference is assigned between two terminals of a voltage source. In the case of a resistor, the current is given by Ohm's law. Once we have circuit elements, building blocks of a circuit, we can construct a circuit by connecting their terminals. A circuit node is a point where two or more circuit elements join. Now, in addition to terminal voltages and currents, we have node properties to be found. Then, what is the equation for a circuit node? As you might know, Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, is the equation for the node. The algebraic sum of all the currents at any node in a circuit equals zero. When we obtain all the terminal voltages and currents, also the node voltages, we say that the circuit is analyzed. For that purpose, usually nodal analysis is applied. In this analysis, node voltages are used as unknown variables. Then, the KCL is applied to each node. Of course, in order to apply the KCL, we must know the branch currents. The branch currents are calculated following the circuit element's own properties. Collecting all KCL evaluated at all nodes, we have a set of coupled equations. By solving the set of equations, the node voltages are obtained. With the node voltages, the branch currents can be readily calculated. The manual circuit analysis is a cumbersome task, and we have several computer codes for the circuit analysis. These codes are categorized as circuit simulators. For example, as commercial ones, we can find H-spice by synopsis, spectre by cadence, and so on. Of course, there are many free codes too. Although each of them has its own name, following the very successful representative program SPICE, a circuit simulator is sometimes called as a SPICE. Although the circuit simulator is not of our primary interest in this course, using the mixed mode capability of the semiconductor device simulator, we will try to simulate various circuits. Next, microelectronics. In the microelectronics, we studied nonlinear circuit elements. Which are nonlinear circuit elements? Maybe you remember diodes 
and transistors. For diode, the current is exponentially dependent on the voltage difference. For transistor MOSFET, we can find multiple operational regions. When it is in the saturation mode, the drain current is proportional to the square of gate to source voltages. As shown in these examples, IV relations are nonlinear. When a circuit has at least one nonlinear circuit element in it, it becomes a nonlinear circuit. The analysis of nonlinear circuits follow the same principle. We can just apply the nodal analysis. The only difference from the linear circuit analysis is the nonlinearity. We must solve a set of coupled nonlinear equations. Since its solution cannot be obtained quickly, an iterative way called as the Newton Lapse method is adopted. One way to realize a diode is to fabricate a PN junction. At equilibrium, no current is allowed. However, the electron hole densities changes rapidly across the junction. It means that we have a huge diffusion current density. In order to make the net current density zero, a strong electric field is needed. The electric field existing even at equilibrium is called the built-in field. The drift current density due to the built-in field cancels out the diffusion current density. Gauss law states that the net charge density is needed to change the electric field. The required net charges are provided by the depletion layer. In contrast to the diode having two terminals, MOSFETs have four or three terminals. The source terminal sets the reference voltage for the device operation and it provides the charge carriers. The gate terminal controls the carrier density in the channel region. When the gate to source voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, the inversion layer appears. On the other hand, for a gate to source voltage lower than threshold voltage, almost no carrier can be found in the channel region. By applying the drain voltage, we obtain the drain current. Following the previous discussion, we can find that drain current is quite small in the sub-threshold region where the gate to source voltage is lower than the threshold voltage. Of course, in reality, we have a non-vanishing leakage current and it is one of the most important quantities. Now, we expect the current conduction when gate to source voltage is higher than threshold voltage. Depending on the drain to source voltage, the MOSFET is operated in the triode region or the saturation one. The MOSFET can generate a sufficiently high transconductance. By using it, a simple amplifier can be realized. Assume the saturation reason. The common source amplifier is considered. When a small voltage is added to the gate voltage, a product of the transconductance and the voltage fluctuation determines the fluctuation of drain current. Since the drain current is slightly changed, it affects the drain voltage too. When the doping polarity, n-type or p-type is inverted, 
we can fabricate a MOSFET. In this device, holes are charge carriers and a technology where both the NMOS and the PMOS are fabricated is called as a CMOS technology. The CMOS technology gives a great advantage, especially in the power consumption. For example, consider a CMOS inverter. An NMOS pad and PMOS pad are connected through their drain terminals. The drain terminal voltage is used as an output. Also, their gate terminals are connected and used as the input terminal. With the input voltage of 0 volt or maximum available voltage VDD, one transistor is turned on and the other is completely turned off. Therefore, the static power consumption is extremely small. Finally, semiconductor devices. Of course, there are lots of things to be studied in the semiconductor devices course, but they will be covered once again in this semester. So, in this lecture one, I will just leave you basic concepts. From the band structure of the semiconducting material, conduction bands and balance bands are identified. They are separated by a band gap. In the case of silicon, it is about 1.12 electron volt. The central question is how many electrons are in the conduction band? In order to answer this question, we have to know two quantities, the density of states and electron distribution. The density of states means the number of available states at a given energy. It can be directly obtained from the band structure. We treat it as a given function. On the other hand, the distribution function the probability to fill an available state changes with the applied voltages. At equilibrium, the distribution function follows the Fermi-Dirac distribution. Here, EF means the Fermi level. The Fermi level describes the energy up to which states are fully filled. It is very useful. So, we wanted to use it even at non-equilibrium cases. In this case, we try to find out on energy level the electron quasi firm level EFN to satisfy the following expression. In other words, the electron quasi firm level is simply a number to represent the number of electrons. It is a position dependent quantity. Also, in general, the electron quasi formula level and the whole one can be different. Now, we know that those quasi formula levels are just another way to represent the carrier numbers. Then, what are the advantages? First, at equilibrium, or when quite close to the equilibrium condition, they become the formula. Also, their gradient determine the carrier velocities. So, when we draw the band diagram, we usually wanted to draw four quantities. The minimum energy of the conduction bands EC the maximum energy of a balance bands EV, the electron quartz formula bell EFN, and the whole quartz formula bell EFP. They are drawn. These four quantities are all position dependent. At a given position, using these numbers, the carrier densities can be easily estimated. From their gradients, the electric force and the velocities can be estimated. In this course, 
using the device simulation result, we will see the usefulness of the band diagram. That's it for this lecture one. In the next lecture, we will discuss equations to be solved in the semiconductor device simulation. Thank you and see you later.